History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 17, on Interpretation, the Concept of Progress, Part 3, January 19th, 1965. I should like to continue with my discussion of the questions I broached in connection with the concept of progress. Perhaps you will, re- perhaps you will recall that last time I finished with the assertion that progress means or I should no doubt say that progress would mean if it were to be genuine progress, escaping from the magic spell. This includes the magic spell of progress, which is itself part of nature, and I argued that humanity becomes aware of its own naturalness, and this enables it to call a halt to its own domination of nature, a domination which enables that of nature to be perpetuated. I shall now move on from there. In earlier lectures, I explained the motif of naturalness, and history, and in general, the idea of history as a natural process. So I have no need to say anything further about that now. We might say, and this is how I finished up last time, that progress occurs where it comes to an end. This heterodox and even heretical view of progress would undoubtedly be, undoubtedly be unanimously condemned throughout the world. Nevertheless, it can be found in coded form. It is implicit in a concept that is, if anything, even more taboo than what I have been saying about progress. The concept I have in mind is that of decadence. This concept was explicitly adopted by the artists of the Jugendstil period to whom we either can condescend or else whom we treat as a sort of museum piece with the somewhat faded charm of the recent past. The fact that they adopted it can only partly be explained by their wish to define their own historical situation, a situation which may well have appeared to them to possess some of the features of biological morbidity. Their impulse to capture or immortalize their historical situation in an image, and in this there were profound similarities with the philosophers of life, implied the conviction that the truth What really mattered was only preserved in whatever appeared to prophesy their own demise and the demise of their culture. In general, the entire art of Jugend still was marked by a peculiar configuration of the worthless and the utopian. If, for example, you look at the writings of Henrik Ibsen, the greatest writer of Jugend still, you will discover that the truth, what really mattered, was salvaged. In his work, the image of utopia consistently ends in nothingness, in destruction. This is true of Rosmersholm, of Johannes Rosmer and Rebecca West, who plunged to their deaths from the bridge in the belief that this will bring them fulfillment. It is true, likewise, of Nora with her belief in the miracle that can never become reality, and also of Hedda Gabler with her fantasies about Eilert Loveborg appearing with vine leaves in his hair, or of Master Builder Solness, who builds the tower on his house, which is supposed to embody his vision and the absolute, even though it has no function and would undoubtedly be judged a monstrosity according to the criteria of modern architecture. This aspect of Jugendstilt calls for very close analysis. It is undoubtedly closely connected with Jugendstil's attitude towards ornaments, which it viewed both as worthless, superfluous, and cut off from reality, and nevertheless as the refuge of the beautiful. I am just pointing out a few of the motifs of the philosophy underlying Jugendstil here. I believe that we could learn an enormous amount from it. This relationship of decadence of the passion for death and utopia and thus the idea of a genuine progress is nowhere expressed more forcefully than it is by a man who will be no more than the name to most of you, but who exercised a huge influence on the Jugendstil generation, or the secession, to give it its Austrian name. This influence reverberated in radical modern art down to the period of my own youth. Among the artists of the, of the avant-garde, he was widely revered and even had a cult following. His name was Peter Altenberg, and Karl Krauss has published a selection from his numerous books. These books deserve to be read very attentively, though, to be sure, with x-ray eyes, since on the surface they are full of banalities and lapses of taste. 
but if you look more closely, you come across quite extraordinary things. Here is an aphorism of Alton Berg's on the subject of progress. I cite it in the form it has in Krauss's selection. Maltreatment of horses. This will only cease when the passers-by have become so irritable and decadent that, abandoning their self-control, they fall into a rage at the sight of such things and in their desperation commit crimes and shoot down the dastardly, cowardly coachman. The inability to bear the sight of horses being maltreated is the act of the neurasthenic, decadent people of the future. Up to now, they have had just enough strength to enable them to mind their own business. I would like to mention, incidentally, Alton Burke's critique of one of the, cons the constants of bourgeois anthropology, namely of the coldness that permits a person to watch even the most extreme actions, because in accordance with the principle of individualism, it is felt to be of no direct concern to himself or herself an attitude which culminates in Auschwitz and everything associated with it, events that would not be possible in the absence of such a principle. In a similar experience, Nietzsche, who condemned pity, had his final breakdown in Turin when he saw a coachman whipping his horse. Decadence was the mirage of the, prog of the progress that had not yet begun. However, narrow-minded and willfully obdurate, the ideal of a remoteness from purpose, from purposes, an ideal that renounced life may have been. It was the reverse image of the false instrumentality of a busy activity in which everything exists only for something else. The rationalism of decadence, which is how the movement liked to designate itself, represented a denunciation of the unreason of the dominant form of reason. It is quite mistaken to equate a happiness that is separated off, arbitrary and privileged with this rationalism a very specific form of irrationalism, incidentally. Such a happiness separated off arbitrary and, if you like, privileged, is sacred to this idea of decadence because it alone guarantees that one has escaped, whereas every direct form of universal happiness in accordance with the fashionable liberal formula of the greatest good of the greatest number sells out of the self-sustaining apparatus the sworn enemy of happiness, even when happiness is advertised as the goal to be attained. It is from such a cast of mind that it dawns on Altenberg that extreme individuation is the stand-in for humanity. I quote him once more, For inasmuch as an individual has a legitimacy of whatever sort, it can only be that of being the, per the first person in some respect, a precursor in some organic development of the human that is part of the possible natural development of all human beings. To be the only one is worthless, a mere whim of fate. To be the first one, and we are speaking here only in temporal terms, is everything. The first person will know that the whole of mankind will follow him. He has only been sent out in advance by God. One day all human beings will be sensitive, tender, and loving. True individuality means being the first to be all those things that everyone, everyone will have to become later on. In passing, I would ask you to note the similarity between this idea of individuality and Hegel's. In Hegel, the artist's individuality is supposed to prove itself in the demise of individuality, of the artist's being thus, and so in the work he creates. And Hegel's general view of the individual is not so far removed from the one expressed by Altenberg, except that Hegel has a certain tendency to move towards a kind of contempt for the individual in favor of the world spirit. In contrast, Altenberg's idea of the individual that is nothing contains the notion that in his nothingness, which in Jugend, Jugend still, often takes the very unfortunate form of the individual as victim. The individual is the locus of a real state of affairs, one that is supposed to rebound to the benefit of all. In other words, all individuals. In this sense, we may even say that the apparently superficial and much criticized ideal of the greatest good of the greatest number can be said to have been salvaged by its negation at the hands of these Jugendstil, artists and thinkers. Only through this extreme and this has something infinitely salutary in the face of the cult of the collective that simmers on beneath the surface today, only through this extreme of differentiation, of individuation, and not as an all-inclusive gen generic term, is it possible to conceive of humanity today? The prohibition imposed by the dialectical theory of both Marx and Hegel on a detailed blueprint for utopia 
senses the betrayal of the idea. Decadence is the nerve center at which the dialectics of progress are, so to speak, physically appropriated by the mind. Whoever inveighs against decadence inevitably takes up the defense of taboos on sex, which the antinomian, even heretical ritual of decadence sets out to flout. In the inst in the insistence upon those taboos in support of the unity of the ego that dominates nature, we hear the rumbling of a blind, unthinking progress. Whereas voices are raised denouncing decadence and insisting on collective progress, the denigration of sexuality is an infallible accompanying accompaniment. This unthinking progress, however, can be convicted of irrationality on the grounds that the methods it uses are transformed by a, by a sleight of hand into goals which are themselves then blocked off. To be sure, the counterposition of decadence remains an abstraction. Hegel would call it abstract negation, and this is one reason why it has become something of a laughing stock. Decadence confuses the particular happiness it is forced to insist upon with an immediately realized utopia, a humanity fulfilled, while it remains deformed by unfreedom, privilege, and a class rule that it openly admits, but also glorifies. Once unleashed, erotic availability would spell perpetual slavery. We see this in Oscar Wilde's Salome, where the beautiful princess treats the attractive prophet as an object wholly at the mercy of her will. Incidentally, in Hedda Gabler, Ibsen, whose dialectical force was truly without precedent, provided a striking image of this affinity between utopia and inhumanity in a scene in which Hedda, who is an icon of the Jugendstil world, appears with her aunt, an elderly woman who has been kind to her and who is the only person in this environment who shows any human feeling. In this scene, Hedda makes her aunt her. In this scene, Hedda makes her aunt look foolish simply by drawing attention to the fact that she is wearing a ridiculous hat that doesn't suit her. If we read Ibsen, or even Wilde and Altenburg, for that matter, with the aid of such categories, we can learn a tremendous amount about such things. I believe, and I would be happy if I could inspire you to attempt it. These problems, incidentally, were then put aside and forgotten with the onset of expressionism, just as whole realms of knowledge in the history of the mind are forgotten. Expressionism... Expressionism was concerned essentially with the protest of human immediacy against reified and sclerotic institutions. It may have been one step ahead of the illusions of Jugendstil, since it found voice for far more drastic experiences and was able to devise a far more drastic world of forms to express them. Nevertheless, despite such advantages, Expressionism sacrificed a great deal of subtlety in comparison to Jugendstil and thus open the door to a certain coarsening and primitivism. It is conceivable that the most durable products of modern art will prove to be those that have benefited from the new developments that began with Expressionism and Cubism, but have preserved some of the subtlety of which you will have perhaps got the flavor from the two brief passages from Altenburg that I have read out to you. The explosive tendency of progress is not simply the flip side of the movement towards the progressive domination of nature. It is not the abstract negation of that tendency, but calls for the development of reason through the, dom through the domination of nature. Only rationality, the principle of social rule as applied to the subject, would be capable of eliminating that domination. The possibility of the emergence of such a principle is brought about by the pressure of negativity. On the other hand, reason, which would like to escape from nature, is what shapes nature into the very thing it has to fear. What makes the concept of progress dialectical in a strictly non-metaphorical sense is the fact that reason, its organ, is just one thing. That is to say, it does not contain two strata, one that dominates nature and one that conciliates it. Both strata share in all its aspects. It is for this reason that we can speak of a dialectic of progress in such a rigorous sense. In reason, the organ of this dialectic these two strata, which I have called the one that dominates nature and the one that conciliates it, do not just subsist alongside one another, but both go to make up the unity of reason in equal measure. The one element only turns into the other, or can only turn into the other literally by reflecting on itself, 
In other words, if reason is applied to reason, and if through this act of self-limitation it emancipates itself from the demon of identity. The incomparable greatness of Kant consists not least in the way in which he incorruptly or incorruptibly held on to the unity of reason, even in, even in its contradictory form. Reason as the domination of nature, or in what he called its theoretical, causal, mechanical aspect, and reason as the conciliatory power of judgment that molds itself to the contours of nature. He rigorously translated the difference between them into the self-limitation of the rationality that dominates nature. A metaphysical interpretation of Kant should not impute to him a latent ontology, but instead should decode the structure of his philosophy as a whole, as a dialectic of, of enlightenment. This was something that Hegel, the dialectician par excellence, failed to appreciate, because in his belief in a single reason, he erased this boundary line and so drived into the mythical totali totality that he thought of as sublated, reconciled in the absolute idea. Progress does not just define the scope of what is dialectical, as in Hegel's philosophy of history, but is dialectical in its own concept, like the categories of the science of logic. Absolute domination of nature is absolute submission to nature, and yet rises above nature when it reflects upon itself. It is myth that demythologizes it myth. The protest of the subject, however, would cease to exist as theory or as contemplation. The idea of the rule of pure reason as something existing in itself, in isolation from practice, subjugates the subject too, molding it into an instrument to be used towards an end. With the assistance of self-reflection, however, reason would achieve its transition into practice. It would perceive itself to be an aspect of practice, instead of consciousness or reason turning itself into something existing in its own right. Rationality would recognize that it is a mode of behavior as opposed to misinterpreting itself as the absolute. The anti-mythological strand in progress is inconceivable without practical action, which curbs the delusion of an autarky of the spirit. This explains why it is so difficult to define progress through a process of disinterested contemplation. This provides a dangerous pretext for the ancient assertion that it, that it, progress, has no right to exist, an assertion that constantly reappears in a new garb. This excuse thrives on the fallacy that, because there has been no progress up to now, there will be none in future. It proclaims that the dreary recurrence of the same is the message of being that must be heard and taken to heart. In reality, being itself, which has this message foisted on it, is a cryptogram of myth, and if we could free ourselves from it, it would be something of a liberation. In elevating historical despair into a norm that must be adhered to, we hear the echo of that revolting adaptation of the theological doctrine of, or of original sin. The idea that the corruption of human nature legitimates domination and that radical evil legitimates evil. This obscurantist conviction makes use of a catchphrase with which to bring the idea of progress into disrepute in modern times. This negative slogan is faith in progress, the attitude or faith in progress. The attitude of those who decree the concept of progress as superficial and positivistic is for the most part positivistic itself. They declare the course of the world, which has constantly thwarted progress, even though it was progressive itself, to be the proof that the universal plan does not tolerate progress, and whoever does not abandon the concept commits sacrilege. In self-righteous profundity, and here you gaze into the abyss of profundity itself, or if you prefer, into its shallows, such people take up sides with everything that is dreadful. They malign the idea of progress in accordance with the belief that if human beings have failed at something, it must have been ontologically impossible. In the name of their finite existence and their mortality, it would be their duty, so they imply, to embrace that finite existence and mortality wholeheartedly. A sober response to their false reverence for being their existential piety, faith in being, or whatever slogans are current nowadays, would assert that our progress from the slingshot to the megaton bomb may well provoke satanic mockery, but that the age of the bomb is the first in which we can envisage a condition from which violence has disappeared. 
At the same time, a theory of progress must absorb the kernel of truth contained in those invectives against the belief in progress. It must do so as an antidote to the mythology from which the theory of progress ails. The last thing that would befit a theory of progress that has been made conscious of itself would be to deny the existence of a superficial theory, simply on the grounds that the ridicule of such a shallow conception belongs in the arsenal of ideology. Condorse it, notwithstanding, the much maligned idea of progress that held sway in the 18th century is far less superficial than that of the 19th. In Rousseau, we find the doctrine of radical perfectibility combined in a highly dialectical manner with that of the radical corruption of human nature. As long as the bourgeois class was oppressed, at least in terms of political forms, it made use of the catchword progress to show its opposition to the prevailing static, static conditions of society. The pathos of that catchword was the echo of that, of that condition. Only when the bourgeoisie had taken over the decisive levers of power did the belief in progress degenerate into the ideology that ideological profundity accused the 18th century of fostering. The 19th century came up against the limits of bourgeois society. It could not realize and practice its own rationality, its own ideals of freedom, justice, and humane immediacy without risking the abolition of its own order. That forced it to credit itself falsely with having achieved what in reality was left undone. This lie, which the educated classes then used to criticize the belief in progress held by uneducated or reformist labor leaders, was the expression of bourgeois apologetics. Admittedly, when the shades of imperialism began to gather, the bourgeoisie promptly abandoned that ideology and resorted to the desperate measure of transforming the negative outlook that the faith in progress had tried to refute into a substantial metaphysics. Whoever rubs his hands in glee and mock humility at the thought of the sinking of the Titanic, on the grounds that the iceberg dealt the first blow to our faith in progress, forgets or suppresses the fact that this calamity, which incidentally was not decreed by fate, led to improvements that prevented unforeseen natural accidents to shipping as opposed to the intentional sinking of ships in wartime over the following half-century. It is an instance of the dialectic of progress that the historical setbacks that are themselves the product of the progressive principle, um, what could be more progressive than the race for the blue ribboned, create the conditions for humanity to discover the remedies that will prevent them in future. The web of delusions surrounding progress extends beyond itself. It is entwined with the order in which the category of progress might first gain its justification, and which in Kant's philosophy goes by the name of mankind. In, in that the devastation wrought by progress can be mended, if at all, only by its own resources, never through the restoration of the previous conditions that were its victim, the progress in mastering nature that in Benjamin's metaphor runs counter to true progress, which has its telos in redemption, is not entirely without hope. The two concepts of progress communicate with each other not simply in averting ultimate catastrophe, but also in every current instance in which universal suffering is eased. The antithesis of faith and progress is faith in interiority. But interiority, man's capacity for improvement, is no guarantee of progress. Even in Augustine, the idea of progress, the word was not yet available to him, was as ambivalent as the dogma of a successful redemption in the face of an as yet unredeemed world. On the one hand, progress is historical, traversing the six epochs corresponding to the ages of man. On the other hand, it is inward, or to use Augustine's term, mystical. Civitas Terina and Civitas Dei are, are invisible realms, and no one can say, or so Augustine asserts, who among the living belongs to the one or the other. To decide that is the prerogative of the secret election to grace, the same divine will that moves history in accordance with its plan. Yet as early as, as Augustine, according to the perceptive comment of Karl Heinz Haig, the interiorization of progress permits the world to be signed over to the powers that be, and therefore, as subsequently in Luther, 
Christianity is to be commended because it preserves the state. Platonic transcendence, which in Augustine is merged with the Christian idea of salvation history, makes it possible to cede this world to the principle that represents everything that progress is designed to overcome, and only on the day of judgment, in defiance of all philosophy of history, to allow the resurrection of an unspoilt creation. This ideological mark has remained engraved in the interiorization of progress to this day. In contrast to this mark, interiorization itself, as the product of history, may be a function either of progress or sometimes of its opposite. The nature of man is no more than one aspect of inner worldly progress, and nowadays it is certainly not the primary one. The argument that there can be no progress because none occurs inwardly is false, because it posits the bogus idea of an immediately humane society in its historical process, whose law is based on what human beings are. However, it is of the essence of historical objectivity. This is an idea I have recently tried to explore in the course of a debate with Arnold Gillen, that whatever human beings have made, institutions in the widest sense, make themselves independent of them and come to form a second nature. That fallacy makes possible the thesis that human nature never changes, a constancy that may be welcomed or deplored. Progress within the world has its mythical side, as Hegel and Marx recognized, and that it takes place over people's heads and forms them in its own image. It is foolish to deny the existence of progress merely on the grounds that it cannot quite cope with its objects, namely human beings. In order to halt what Schopenhauer calls the revolving wheel, what would be needed would be the human potential that is not completely absorbed by the necessity of historical movement. The idea that progress offers a way out is blocked today because the subjective aspects of spontaneity are beginning to atrophy in the, in the historical process. The desperate idea that we find in the French existentialists that an isolated, ostensibly ontological conception of subjective spontaneity can have any hope of defeating the omnipotence of society is, I repeat, too optimistic, even as an expression of despair. A spontaneity that might turn the tide cannot be conceived of outside its entanglement with society. It would be an illusion of idealism to hope that a spontaneous gesture could prove effective here. Such hopes are entertained simply and solely because, at the moment, there is no basis for hope in the objective historical trend. Existentialist decisionism is merely the, re the reflex reaction to the seamless totality of the world's spirit. Nevertheless, this totality, which I referred to in the first part of this lecture course, is itself mere appearance. The ossified institutions, the relations of production, are not absolute being, but man-made and revocable, however powerful they may be. In their relations to the subjects from which they originate and which they hold in their grip, they remain antagonistic through and through. It is not merely that, that the totality demands change if it is not to perish, but also because of its antagonistic nature, it finds it impossible to impose that full identity with human beings that is depicted in negative utopias. This explains why progress in the world, the arch enemy of that other progress, nevertheless remains open to the possibility of it, no matter how little it is able to assimilate this possibility into its own law. Against this, it can be plausibly argued that intellectual spheres such as art, and even more convincingly, law, politics, and anthropo anthropology, do not advance with such vigor as the material force, uh, forces of production. Hegel said as much himself, and Jochman reiterated it in even more extreme terms. The idea that the superstructure and the base do not move in tandem was formulated by Marx in his assertion that the superstructure is transformed more slowly than, than the base. Evidently, no one was surprised by the idea that spirit, which is fluid, volatile, should be static in contrast to the rudis indigestac mollus, shapeless, uncoordinated mass of what was known, and not for nothing. Even in the context of society, as matter. Similarly, psychoanalysis taught that the unconscious from which the conscious realm and the objective shapes of mind were nourished was supposedly ahistorical, historical 
to be sure whatever is considered as the product of a brutal classification, to be culture in which even contains subjective consciousness, raises a perennial protest against the eternal sameness of mere existence. But its protests are perennially thwarted. The eternal sameness of the totality mankind's dependence upon the necessities of life, the material conditions of self-preservation, hides behind, behind, hides behind its own dynamism, the growth of ostensible social wealth. Ideology profits from this. Spirit, however, Spirit, however, which, as the truly dynamic principle, would like to transcend this state, is told that it has failed, and this pleases ideology even more. Reality creates the illusion that it is moving onwards and upwards, while remaining at bottom what it was before. Spirit aims at something new, insofar as it is not just part of an existing apparatus, but in its hopeless attempts to create it, it vainly batters its head against the old, much as an insect attracted to the light flies into the window pane. Spirit is not what it aspires to be. The other, the transcendent in all its purity, it too is a piece of natural history, because natural history appears in society as something dynamic. Spirit, ever since Plato and the Eletics, has imagined itself to possess the other, that which is removed from the Civitas Terena in an immutable, self-same sphere, and its forms, above all those of logic, which are latent in all intellectual activities, are tailored accordingly. In these forms, spirit is taken over by that immobile, something that is that it has resisted, while still remaining part of it. The spell cast by reality over spirit prevents it from soaring above mere existence, the very thing that its own concept wants it to do. As something more fragile and evanescent, spirit is all the more susceptible to oppression and mutilation. As the repository of everything that, prog that progress might be over and above all progress, spirit stands at an angle to the progress that actually occurs, and this does it credit. Through its less than wholehearted complicity with progress, it proclaims what progress really amounts to. However, wherever we have reason to say that the conscious spirit progresses, it means that spirit is complicit in the domination of nature. And this happens because instead of being chorus, separated off, as it imagines, it is in fact entwined in the life process, from which it had parted company in accordance with the law of that process. With this observation, I should like to finish today. Next time, I shall continue by saying something about the ways in which spirit is caught up in the domination of nature.